In recent years, there has been a noticeable increase in the number of photographs and videos that captured images of strange creatures or events, for which there exist more questions than answers. This one oh, is yep. trying you today? Yeah, it's trying me. This okay. is from Amarillo, Texas, Amarillo, Texas. It shows an unknown figure walking around a perimeter fence at the Amarillo Zoo. The creature is wolf-like, I guess. It, to me, sort of looks like the Sonic before they, yeah. you know, had to fix it, but <laughs> anyway. Lately, we've also seen several viral videos that captured strange animal behavior that would seem to affect multiple species. Photographic evidence has also revealed that there may be more to the strange crop circle phenomena than one may have initially believed. In this clip, two orbs of light fly over a field, and then crop circles suddenly appear beneath them. All of this is happening in real time. This is an older video, and the images are a bit grainy, but other than that, it seems to be authentic. In this clip, a drone captured what would seem to be an invisible giant or some sort of force shaking a particular set of trees in a forest, as if they were small twigs of grass, and then at the end of the clip, one can see something large disappearing into the forest. One immediately wonders what could cause something like this, but when considering several other videos in which similar events are filmed, one realizes that there may be more to this requiring further investigation. In another clip, a father and son are walking in a forest, when they came across some sort of camouflaged creature that would seem to blend in with its surroundings. Do you see that? Over there, look, 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 over there. Do you see that? What the hell? Wait, 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 that, because that was it again, right there, right there. Wait, 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 wait. I don't like this. You see that? Right there. Look, 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 look. Oh my look. god. That's not an animal. Uh, I don't like it. Okay, 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 fuck. These incidents remind one of movies such as Predator in which a predatory alien being is shown to have exactly the same abilities as those that were captured by unsuspecting people in these video clips. Then again, there are several patents out there in which invisibility devices are described that would allow the kind of camouflage that one sees in these clips. So are they pointing us to something supernatural, or is this simply technology that the world at large has not had much exposure to? What do you think about these? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. We know that the media has been hard at work using predictive programming for many years to show the public the truth in plain sight without most knowing what they were looking at. And this phenomenon is almost perfectly explained in this clip from The Matrix, which came out in 1999, describing exactly the world that we live in today. The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Whether we are looking at new technology, or in some instances, things that can only be described as something supernatural, one wonders what is preventing entities or crafts such as UFOs, which would seem to have supernatural or extra-dimensional qualities and abilities from coming out of hiding and invading communities and neighborhoods? And why do they remain so elusive when they clearly have superior abilities to that of humanity? I believe the Bible provides an answer to this question, just as God's word predicted more than 2,000 years ago that the Euphrates River would dry up in the time of the end. And we are seeing those prophecies coming to pass before our eyes today. The Bible also speaks of a restrainer that is holding back the Antichrist from making his public appearance. In the same passage, we are told of the associated powers, the signs and the lying wonders that will accompany his arrival on the world stage, with the specific intent to deceive the world and the same power that is preventing the Antichrist from making his appearance 
would also seem to be holding back creatures and phenomena that require elaborate explanations for their existence. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. This passage specifically states that the Antichrist has a specific time assigned for his revealing to the world, and I believe our Heavenly Father has marked that time for us in the heavens according to a pattern that marked another type of Antichrist's rise to power. That, of course, was the rise of Adolf Hitler, which started in 1933. God's word says that our Heavenly Father uses repeating patterns and that the heavens serve as signs that point out the times for us. I discuss this timing associated with the Antichrist's rise to power in this video if you have not seen it yet. What does all of this have to do with the iPetco 2 animation? That is a good question. Every year there are interesting aspects surrounding this predictive programming tool of the enemy that jumps out at us and in 2023 I believe there are very specific aspects that are of great importance that we need to take note of. We have also seen several aspects in this animation playing out just as predicted, but the more accurate word to use here in the place of predicted would be planned. And it is important to take note of the fact that this animation was released back in 2012. The animation starts off by showing us how the powers that be, or humanity's enemy, plans to control the world by telling us that we are their pet goats and that they plan to mark us with barcodes and confine us to boxes so that we are unable to move. In 2023, we know very well how the illness and the associated treatment affected people over the past three years across the globe, removing many freedoms that were taken for granted and making life for those who opposed the new mandates and rules very difficult. This animation even shows us the method through which the public would be convinced to submit to the propaganda and that fear combined with the media would be that motivating factor that would cause people to submit to this agenda. Those who have submitted to the fear and who have rolled up their sleeves have allowed the powers that be to place their mark on them, and those who have refused have on many occasions faced severe difficulties, and many have even lost their livelihoods. In the next move to restrict people's ability to move around, just as shown to us in the iPetco 2 animation, the Oxfordshire County Council announced at the end of November of 2022 the implementation of traffic filters through which people would be coaxed into staying in the zone that they currently live in, just as this image shows an obedient pet goat confined to a box. For a person living in one of the six zones in Oxfordshire County, a travel pass will be issued with which they can make 100 trips per year to a zone that is outside of their own. However, should their travel pass run out, they will receive a fine for every instance in which they cross the boundary line. And given that a person may work in a zone that is outside of that boundary, there are 161 days per year for which they could then expect a fine, if the assumption is that no work is performed over weekends. Does that not feel just like being placed in a box with only your head sticking out? In 1980, Ken Peters was given a dream in which the tribulation was shown to him, and in this dream he clearly saw how people's movement would be restricted, requiring approved papers to cross state lines or state borders in the USA. One thing that was happening is that you could not cross state lines at this time without papers. You had to have current papers to cross state lines. That was very, very strange to me. You know, if, matter of fact, uh, if it hadn't have probably been for Prophecy Club, I would have probably never really believed that part of my dream. I, I, I don't think I would have ever believed that our country would become a place where you can't cross border to border without papers, approved papers. But I saw it, and it was astounding to me. We are seeing this being put in place before our eyes as we speak. 
We have also seen how the war between Russia and Ukraine was predicted in this animation, showing us a bear opposed to Mickey Mouse in a war that started on February 24th of 2022, just as shown to us in another accurate prediction, which is discussed in this video for those who may have missed it. So knowing that this animation is indeed a predictive programming tool in the hands of the enemy, what else can we glean from it? In this scene of the animation, you will note that a 9-11 type event is planned for a time during which America will experience winter. Now one may argue that the fact that the two towers that fall have human-like features may point to the process through which humanity has been attacked by poisonous substances that were presented as cures for an illness with the intent to lower the number associated with the global population. This process started back in December of 2019, and that may very well be an application to what the scene represents, but several other pointers tell us that the pandemic and the associated mandates do not complete the narrative. The USA or modern-day Babylon has not fallen yet, as depicted in the scene where the American flag is torn and this would very likely form part of the next event in which two more towers are planned to be pulled just as on September 11, 2001. So what is the iPad Go 2 animation showing us for 2023? A scene that I often focus on is this one in which a girl with a tiger on her back tries to mediate in a conflict that I have already pointed out involving Russia and Ukraine but which would now require mediation after the use of a nuclear weapon. 2022 represented the Chinese year of the tiger, which would then point to this mediation process starting before the end of the year of the tiger. This mediation process is then interrupted by a skeleton that would seem to represent death, and this is accompanied by a celebration that brings darkness over the world. Now in previous years, it was difficult to identify or correctly label the celebration of fireworks, and one would often think that the imagery used in this scene pointed to the Day of the Dead, which is celebrated on November 2nd. However, in 2023, this celebration could have a very different but also very important meaning that is corroborated by another scene in this animation where darkness also descends at the same time, as shown in the skeleton scene. This is something that has happened for the first time since 2012 when this animation was published. 2023 marks the Chinese year of the rabbit, and it would make sense then that this celebration which ends in darkness, that descends over the world, may be pointing to the fireworks display marking the celebration of the Chinese New Year of the rabbit. The corroborating scene that I also often focus on is the classroom scene, in which we have another instance in which darkness descends, in this instance, there just happens to be a rabbit on the back wall, which becomes the focal point when darkness descends. The highlighted rabbit, in my opinion, would confirm what we are shown in the skeleton scene where darkness descends during New Year celebrations of the Chinese New Year of the rabbit, if these events apply to 2023. This year, the Chinese New Year falls on January 22nd, but there is more information that is depicted on the back wall of the classroom. In previous years, I assumed that the rabbit may have been connected to Easter, and that would then assign monthly properties to the stocks that are shown between the emergency exit door and the rabbit. However, knowing that the year of the rabbit starts on January 22nd, the stocks may represent or indicate days between an exit event and the arrival of the Chinese New Year. This would then position the emergency exit around January 18th of 2023, which could mark the time at which the restrainer could be removed, if my understanding is correct. This could also represent the time at which the rapture of the church occurs. But as always, I am merely looking at the information before me and drawing conclusions based on what is written in God's word, and as always, I could be wrong. This, however, is probably the strongest connection I have ever been able to draw between events shown to us in this animation and what has actually been occurring in the world. So I am certainly really excited about this and cannot wait to see how this turns out. Knowing that many have been given dreams and visions of the Antichrist being crowned in obscurity and that the heavens point to his public rise to power towards the end of March 2023, 
and knowing that God's word shows us that the Antichrist will be preceded by ten Nephilim kings, and that he will depose three of them before he rises to power, there is not a lot of time between now and the end of March for all of this to happen. We also know that God's word shows us that the period known as the beginning of sorrows is a time that was prophesied in the book of Daniel, and that this was set apart for God's church to be judged. And at the time of making this video, there remained about 180 days until the 1290 days of God's judgment of his church runs out. This would also seem to approximately match the period given to Kent Peters in his dream about the tribulation between the time of the rapture and the start of the persecution or the tribulation, during which people will be executed if they refuse to renounce their faith and accept the enemy's mark in their bodies which they would have taken voluntarily before this point in time. I was on my way to conduct another business transaction and I ran into an individual. A very strange thing happened at this point. He was very, very excited and began to talk to me about something he had just experienced. I'm going to go fairly quickly with this so that we can uh, move along. This is a very poor rendering, but we are putting together a very uh, good rendering of this. This man has said to me, Ken, uh, I introduced myself to him. He was very excited. And he said, have you got your identification mark? And I said, I don't know what you mean. What's an identification mark? He says, uh, they've just enacted a new identification mark. And by the way, this started with a voluntary implementation first. You, you, you did it voluntarily first. This man told me, you ought to get yours done real soon to avoid the hassle because soon everyone, they say, will have to have this to conduct business. I have found it so amazing to see how our Heavenly Father would drop certain thoughts in my mind and then confirm them through words, visions or dreams that He gives to others. I've had several confirming words regarding this information over the past few weeks which has also given me additional insight into what happened in the world since September 23, 2017. The very unique heavenly sign that God provided for us in the heavens on September 23, 2017 marked the fulfillment of His word that is given to us in Revelation 12. However, because of the prayers of His people, a period of grace which is associated with the number 5, or 5 years and 364 days, the maximum number of days that can be counted before reaching the six-year mark was proclaimed over the earth. Satan is aware of this time, but very angry about the fact that he had to wait, and I believe he is not as patient as our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father, through His grace, gave His children more time to turn from their wicked ways and to humble themselves before Him. But a more important intent of our Heavenly Father was to get the enemy to compete unlawfully with God over his harvest, to have him sow tares among the good seed and to steal from God's harvest before the owner had the opportunity to enjoy that which belongs to him. This will be an indictment against Satan for which he will have to make restitution. According to God's word, Paul points out how the owner of the field must be the first partaker of the fruit concerning striving for masteries or competing to be the winner. Ask yourself this, why would the Holy Spirit inspire Paul to point out legal competition when it comes to God's harvest? Is that not a strange or unexpected connection or association to make? Why would the owner of a harvest have to compete for his own crop, since it belongs to him already? God's word, however, shows us that there will be competition involved, and that God's word will judge the participants on whether they competed lawfully. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Jesus knew that Satan would not compete legally in the battle for the harvest, and he pointed this out already in a parable in which he told his disciples that Satan would sow tares into his field. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. 
But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Did you notice when the enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat? This happened while men slept, and I believe this time refers to the grace period of five years that followed the Revelation 12 sign. This is not the only time in which God's word mentions this period to us, referring to people sleeping. We see another instance of this in the parable of the ten virgins. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. This passage clearly associates a period of sleeping with the bridegroom delaying his arrival. If we combine the information from these two passages, we see that Jesus intentionally delayed his return so that the enemy would sow tears into God's harvest as well as steal from it, which would make Satan guilty of competing unlawfully for the harvest that belongs to Jesus. This transgression of our enemy is also shown to us in the statue that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, where the feet, instead of only the toes, consisted of iron and clay, once again pointing out to us how the enemy would unlawfully compete for Jesus' harvest. How did the enemy sow his seed into the field? We know that with the DNA editing and splicing technology contained in the snake bites, it has become possible for the enemy to mingle his seed with that of humanity, and God's word warning us against this in Daniel chapter 2 verse 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. The Bible also told us to expect a delay when it comes to Jesus gathering in his harvest, even though we were often hoping for absolutely no delay, and being very disappointed to discover that our expectations were dashed on many occasions as high watch dates passed us by, again and again for more than five years since the Revelation 12 sign was fulfilled. Be patient therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Once again, I believe God's word also points to this as being a test for those who were waiting for his return, to see how they would react or respond to his delay. And we read about those who would be offended at his delay, which is once again associated with sowing and reaping and a time of persecution. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. How many Christians have given up on looking for the return of the bridegroom since September 23, 2017? because the disappointment of not seeing him on the first day that they expected to see him appear is simply too much to handle and caused many to even lose their faith. I would say that one should seriously question a person's faith that is so soon shaken and whether they even believed that Jesus is their Savior. Many who call themselves Christians have also turned into scoffers who mocked the watchmen that continued to diligently watch for the bridegroom's return and warned the world about the coming events, even though the arrival of some of these events have been delayed. Jesus is the Word, and what persecution would one associate arising for the Word's sake, or for Jesus' sake? Would this not point to God's judgment that begins with His Church? Would God's judgment of His Church not be for His sake, through which He will present Himself a glorious Church without spot or wrinkle? 
For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Knowing that we are dealing here with God's faith harvest, which consists of three parts, of which the word shows us that only the first fruits have thus far been removed, how would Jesus separate between the portion that he takes home with him, or the owner's portion, and that portion known as the corners or the gleanings that he will leave behind to the poor and the stranger, according to his instructions in Leviticus 23? We do not consider the position of an ear in the field to determine whether they belong to him or whether they will be left to the poor and the stranger. Remember that God watches over his word to fulfill it, and he will never break his word. If we assume that he will not leave a portion of his harvest behind to the poor, then we are calling him a liar and a thief, and we know that he calls those who think of him in this way evil servants. Many believe that all who have received salvation will go in the rapture, but the Bible clearly shows us that it is only those who have kept his word, who have not denied Jesus' name, and who have continued watching faithfully for his return, while also enduring persecution by both the world and fellow Christians, and who have stayed close to the Heavenly Father, who will be spared from the hour that is about to come over the world. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass, and to stand before the Son of Man. Jesus warns many of the other churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 to repent or to suffer the consequences. In Matthew 24, we are also told that at the end of the period that is known as the beginning of sorrows, many will be offended when they are delivered up for affliction and to be put to death. And I believe many of these will be believers who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and have we not done that in your name? Only to discover that their beliefs did not align perfectly with God's word, and specifically refusing to deal with the sin in their lives as instructed in God's word. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Looking back, we know that if Jesus did not bring about this delay in his return that moved the enemy to enter his field, to sow tears into it and to begin to steal from it before the owner had the opportunity to enjoy the fruits thereof, there would be no legal way in which Jesus would be able to fulfill this passage from Colossians. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Our Heavenly Father's will is to be reconciled with all things in His creation, even with things in heaven that require reconciliation. How would that be possible, since Jesus' payment on the cross was only for the sins of humanity, and did not include redemption for the angels or demons? When we consider the penalty for those who steal, as in the case of Satan, who entered God's field, and who began to steal from it, before the owner had the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of his labor, 
we see that the enemy will be expected to give back sevenfold as well as give everything that he owns. A very severe punishment for theft, of which Satan was already shown to be found guilty as charged in the book of Daniel. I discuss this legal case against Satan in this video if you've missed it. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry, but if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold, he shall give all the substance of his house. So if Satan entered God's field illegally and stole from it, before Jesus could enjoy the fruits of it, Satan will be charged with theft, and will be judged according to Proverbs 6, and will be shown to have competed unlawfully. On the other hand, if Satan waited for his time before entering God's harvest, it would have been a totally different situation, and he would have been able to keep everything that he gained over the past 6,000 years. Knowing that the penalty of Proverbs 6 will be imposed on our enemy for his transgression during this time of grace, Jesus will become the new owner of those that now legally belong to Satan. And this may not be via the way of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ alone, but via restitution that Satan will have to make for competing illegally for Jesus' harvest, leaving him with an empty house and voiding all of his efforts over the past 6,000 years. And except for the false prophet and the Antichrist, who are also shown to be tormented in the lake of fire forever with Satan, according to God's word, everything else, including the things in heaven that require reconciliation with Jesus, will be transferred back to Jesus and become his legal property again. Is it not amazing to see how our Heavenly Father is able to outsmart our adversary in every situation where Satan thinks that he has won? And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Jesus pointed to a period known as the beginning of sorrows that will lead into the tribulation and which I believe was specifically set aside for him to judge his church for the sake of his word and we also see this referenced in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows." The first thing that Jesus points out in this passage is the deception that those that love the truth should watch out for. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, which described the time leading up to the revealing of the Antichrist, we see that it is Jesus who sends this deception over the world, which he is using to judge his church, just as Daniel's three friends were judged when they were asked to bow before a golden statue. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not in the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. During this time our Heavenly Father is judging those who belong to His church to see if they would pass the test described in Revelation 3 verse 8 to 10 and Luke 21 verse 36. Knowing that the start of this period, which is known as the beginning of sorrows, would be marked by an interruption of normal daily life, as described in the book of Daniel, one can also know the exact day on which this period will end, September 22, 2023. However, Jesus promised that he would shorten those days for those that he chose, and our Heavenly Father confirmed this understanding to me in a word that was given to a fellow brother and sister in Christ. Please listen to the first sentence specifically with which this prophetic word begins that would seem to be a one-month warning and how it fits in with the rest of today's discussion. I shall not tarry in the fields of sorrows, for judgment comes to the unrepentant. The harvest has begun, for this is the season of truth. Many have spoken of this time, but only the few shall bear witness to what shall be. 
there shall be a great shout from the heavens, one not witnessed from the beginning. This shall usher in the great and terrible day wow. of the Lord, for my wrath is kindled. I got the Holy Ghost from my it. toes right to my head. Yes, my arms. Look at my arms. I got it too. Have you prepared for this day? Those that call me Father shall find solace in these words. Amen. Wow. Wow. When Jesus says that he will not tarry in the field of sorrows, this could have one of two meanings. Either Jesus will shorten the time assigned to those that he has chosen to be part of his glorious church, meaning that they will not have to wait until the end of the 1290 days, or he will not allow any additional time to be added to this period which is described as the beginning of sorrows in his word. Whatever the case may be, it would seem that the tribulation will be in full swing in September of this year, while the world transitions from the old world order to the new world order, with the Antichrist at its head. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you are almost out of time at the time of this video's posting. To receive salvation is very easy, and having obtained salvation allows one to become part of God's faith harvest. How to receive salvation is explained in Romans 10 verse 9 to 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. However, having received salvation does not activate one as a vessel through which the Holy Spirit can operate. Only when one is baptized does one receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I can attest to this, being raised in a church where baptism came before salvation. And for many years of my life I wondered why I had not received any gifts of the Holy Spirit until I followed the instructions in God's Word. I believe God allowed me to experience this to see how this is a clever ploy of the enemy to rob God's children of the gifts that they were supposed to have as saved believers. And putting baptism before salvation does not result in the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in a believer as they should. First, you have to repent from your old life, realizing that you are a sinner in need of salvation, because none of us are good enough to save ourselves when we consider the standards set out in God's word. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. When you have been saved and baptized, you also have to be aware of the fact that as you grow closer to God in your walk of spiritual growth, you will continue to sin while you exist in a mortal body. Our Heavenly Father, however, will not allow any sin to enter into His kingdom. Many Christians today believe that having obtained salvation provides an unconditional ticket into heaven, and that salvation alone takes care of all your sins and that you can set aside passages in which God's word instructs us about dealing with our sins after we are saved. Such a belief can only be arrived at if one throws out several books of the Bible and focus only on specific select passages. This belief also does not align with the patterns provided to us in the harvest and temple models that were specifically provided for our understanding of the order of events associated with the first resurrection. I have done a five-part series on this in which this is covered in much detail. We struggle with sin daily, and if we claim that we don't, God's word calls us liars. The Bible provides an example of our requirement to be washed by Jesus in two instances, even after we are saved. First, Jesus instructed Peter to allow him to wash his feet, which is symbolic of our life in this world. Daily our feet become muddy as we interact with the world and our sinful nature. Jesus addresses the situation with Peter in the following passage. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. 
Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. Notice that Peter was the one who announced his salvation to the world when he told Jesus what he believed in his heart, which he then openly shared with Jesus and the other disciples. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When we compare Peter's actions with what is written in Romans 10 verse 9 to 10, Peter qualified as a person who received salvation. Peter believed in his heart and confessed with his mouth that Jesus is the Son of God before others, and therefore, according to the requirements of God's word, he qualified as a perfect example of someone who had received salvation. It is then interesting that Jesus speaks to Peter specifically, the believer who received salvation, about the requirement for Jesus to wash his feet. Peter first reacted as some Christians would do today, who believe that having received salvation, their sins no longer have to be dealt with. Jesus points out that if Peter did not allow Jesus to wash his feet, that Peter would have no part in him. When Peter then asked Jesus to wash more than required, Jesus explained to him that a person who has been saved only requires their feet to be cleansed, and it is Jesus who performs that cleansing, if only we would humble ourselves and ask him to cleanse us. Secondly, in Ephesians 5 we read about Jesus' love for the church, and that it is once again Jesus who cleanses his church, so that he can present it to himself without spot or wrinkle. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with a washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The question now is this, if we understand that our feet will continue to require washing until we have received bodies that are no longer subjected to our sinful natures, and knowing that Jesus will not allow any sin to enter his kingdom, but that he wants to cleanse us, what do we have to do to have Jesus wash us clean from our sins? The answer is found in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we humble ourselves before Jesus, recognizing our inability to cleanse ourselves of our sins and confessing the sins that the Holy Spirit convicts us of to Jesus, he cleanses us not only of the sins that we confessed, but of every unrighteousness that is in us. I believe the depths of our sinfulness go far beyond what we can know or acknowledge. But this passage tells us that if we confess the sins that the Holy Spirit convicts us of, Jesus cleanses us not only from those sins, but also from everything else that may be offensive to Him, causing us to stand before Him without spot or wrinkle. It is all His work that He does in our lives, if only we will allow Him to wash us by confessing our sinfulness to Him. How amazing is that? We do not deserve such amazing grace from our Savior, and so many of God's children are rejecting His offer to wash them of their daily sins. Remember that Jesus told Peter that if He does not wash our feet, we have no part in Him, and before we can enter His kingdom, we have to be without spot or wrinkle. If you have not been saved, would you not consider giving your life to our Heavenly King today? Think about it. What do you have to lose? Do you really want to strive for a life in this world where you will end up being the pet goat of the enemy, stuck in a box with a number on your head, and unable to move? Is that really what you want? And do you really think that you will be happy living such a life? I certainly don't want any part of such an existence. And I believe our Heavenly Father has prepared the most amazing future for us with Him, and we should run our race on this earth and in this life in such a way that we can obtain the prize. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize?
so run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. If you have been saved, would you not humble yourself before Jesus and also ask Him to wash you clean every time that the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin that is in your life? Jesus will not allow muddy feet into the wedding chamber. And if it is pride or ignorance that causes a person to stand before Jesus with dirty feet when he comes, it would not matter because no sin will enter into his kingdom. I hope that you will think about this today as we continue to wait. Also keep your eyes on January 18th through the 22nd, which marks the time leading up to the Chinese New Year of the Rabbit. It would seem that the enemy knows something about this window of time that he has shown to the world, hoping that no one will see the truth, but God's word says that there is nothing that is covered that will not be revealed. Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. My understanding could be flawed, but if the interpretation is correct, our blessed hope could be just around the corner. If we are still here when nuclear escalation occurs shortly before January 22nd, then we could probably consider that as confirmation of our assured departure from this world, before the Antichrist steps onto the scene. Are you ready for what's coming? May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you. May He lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless. Speak unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this is the word. My son, hear this. Holy is my name. Holy is my name. Holy is my name. As you write what I speak to you, give ear to the multitude of voices singing, Holy is your name. Worthy is the Lamb. As soon as he spoke those words, give ear to the multitude singing, I suddenly heard for a few seconds what sounded like many multitudes of voices singing, Holy is your name, and worthy is the Lamb. The singing stopped, and I continued to write. For soon, all those that are mine will be singing that song in heaven's gates. I tell you now, the rejoicing in my kingdom will be unprecedented. My son, many in my body do not know what holiness means. They say the word in praise and worship, yet they do not walk in holiness. I came to be an example to men, to walk a holy and righteous path. My great name is nothing more than a slang expression or a vulgar comeback. Very soon, all men will see me as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Holy is my name. Repent now. My son, as the time of the end draws to a close, many will be caught unaware that the day is upon them. Many are running to and fro, caring more for the things of this world instead of casting their eyes toward eternity. I say now, the day of the Lord is near, and many will miss the grand entrance. I am coming soon to those who look for my appearing and are walking in great faith and holiness. Be ye holy, saith the Lord. My son, continue to shout, Wake up to my sleeping body. My remnant, continue to shout, Wake up to my comatose body. The lines have been drawn. The marking of my chosen ones complete. I say now, the harvest is ready. My remnant are ready. The angels are ready. Now do what I have called you to do. Holy is my name, and I bless you, chosen from the foundation of creation. I choose you. You did not choose me. 
for this end time harvest is now. Do not look at the situations in this world. Stay focused on your mission that I have given you. Stay in prayer, interceding for the lost ones I have marked. Stay in my word. Your strength comes through that. I love you very much. Holy is my name. Amen, Lord Jesus.